Okay, welcome to Ayn Rand Con 2020. I'm Keith Lockich, the Vice President of Educational Programs at the Ayn Rand Institute, and I will be co-hosting this event with my colleague Ilan Giorno. We have a lot of people attending this event from Latin America. So, bienvenidos or bienvindo, depending on where you're coming from. So, we are thrilled to have all of you here from all over North and South America and anywhere else in the world you might be joining us from. As of this morning, we had over 370 people registered to attend this event and more than 140 of them are from Latin America. So welcome to all of you. Now, in addition to our registered attendees, we have a whole bunch of people watching tonight's talk on our free live stream. Just for tonight, this welcome session and the keynote talk, which we're about to hear, are being live streamed out publicly. We're live streaming in English to YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope on the Ayn Rand Institute channels. We're live streaming in Spanish to YouTube on the Ayn Rand Center Latin America channel. And we're live streaming, live streaming in Portuguese on YouTube to the Objetivismo Brasil Oficial channel. So welcome to anybody who's watching on any of these channels. Okay, so if you're just joining us now, welcome to Ayn Rand Con 2020. We're gonna start off with some announcements and some welcome remarks. I, I wanna take some time to orient you for how we're gonna be running this event over Zoom. And we'll start the keynote talk as soon as we're ready. It's, it's scheduled to begin at the top of the hour, 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. We'll probably start a few minutes early, so don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for tonight's talk. Before I introduce our first speaker, I want to take a moment to express our gratitude to the sponsors that made this conference possible. The major funding for this event was provided by the Michael and Andrea Levin Family Foundation. The Levin Foundation has been a major sponsor for this conference for the past six years, and we deeply appreciate all the support that we've received. We're also grateful to the rest of our sponsors whose generous contributions are essential to making these, this, these conferences happen. So thank you to Lauren and Kathy Corley, Ellen and Harris Kenner, Steve Kreisman, Evan Picot. Thank you all for supporting this event. Now, we're really pleased to have Michael Levin with us here on Zoom, and he's graciously agreed to say a few words. Mr. Levin has had a long and very successful business career focused in the hospitality industry and spanning some 55 years. Most recently, he served as the chairman and chief executive officer of Georgia Aquarium, and prior to that, he led Las Vegas Sands Corporation as President and Chief Operating Officer. So, Mr. Levin, would you like to turn on your camera and your microphone and, and you can say a few words? Not a problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, Tal, and everyone from the Ayn Rand Institute for having me this, this evening. And welcome everybody to the, uh, I guess, the seventh conference that I've been involved in uh, over these last years. As you are all witnessing around the world today is a very interesting day for the United States of America and the democracy that we've represented since 1776. It gives you pause to watch the difficulties that are involved in managing personal freedom and managing the situation and the systems involved. I am a big believer in Ayn Rand's philosophies, have read her books, and manage my life according to those books. Each and every person attending these conferences needs to be a, a, an advocate for personal freedom, for rational self-interest, for the basic elements of the her philosophy that makes for a better world. It is not only in the United States that problems arise it's all over the world and in the countries that you are watch, here to watch and participate in and come from. I ask all of you, all of you who are here to absorb yourself in the teachings of tonight and, for, and in the future, because you will be the advocates for personal freedom and self-interest and responsibility.
to maintain a free world and a better world for all people. So it's my honor to participate. It's my honor to sponsor. And it's my honor to be with you. And I wish you all well, but it will be a battle in the future. Please make sure that you stand up for the principles that you will learn. And I remain your friend and advocate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Levin. Thank you for your words of welcome. And thank you again for your continued support. We greatly appreciate it. One last thing before we start. So this conference is being presented by the Ayn Rand Institute or ARI. And as you can see from my background here, we're broadcasting from the uh, ARI offices in Santa Ana, California. Now, since we have so many people joining us who might not be familiar, um, who might not be familiar with Ayn Rand's ideas, I wanted to take a moment to play a video that introduces you to the work that ARI does. So let me do that now. This is the Ayn Rand Institute, where the legacy of one of the world's most innovative and important thinkers is protected both ideologically and physically. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present one of America's best-selling authors, a woman who's read by millions around the world. Here is philosopher Ayn Rand. Miss Rand, you are something. I think so. Founded in 1985 by Ayn Rand's intellectual heir, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, ARI's mission is to foster awareness, understanding, and acceptance of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. Reality exists as an objective absolute. Man must live as an end in himself and to hold reason as an absolute. His highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness. We strive to create a culture whose guiding principles are reason, rational self-interest, individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism. A culture in which individuals are free to pursue their own happiness, lighting the way to a world filled with prosperity, human flourishing on an unimaginable scale. So how do we do it? First, we protect the Ayn Rand archives, the most comprehensive collection of Rand's materials in the world, her personal papers, correspondences, and other items which illuminate her intellectual development and cultural impact. We encourage young people to read Ayn Rand, seeking to ignite them with a passion for Rand's ideas. We distribute her books to tens of thousands of teachers and through them, to millions of students in our free books for teachers and Ayn Rand essay contest program. We make available all of Ayn Rand's and Leonard Peikoff's interviews, lectures, courses through our Ayn Rand Institute web campus, mobile app and YouTube channel. And we are seeing dramatic growth in the engagement with this content by a worldwide audience. Our intellectuals speak to audiences all over the world, teach courses, publish articles and write books applying objectivist ideas. At our Objectivist Academic Center, we're teaching and nurturing a new generation of intellectuals who can carry Rand's system of ideas forward with a genuine understanding and accuracy. We have the best philosophy school on earth. Anyone who fights for the future lives in it today, said Ayn Rand. So to all of you helping ARI fight for a better future, thank you. You see deeper and farther than most people around you. And this is the Ayn Rand Institute. Okay, now we also have with us on Zoom the CEO of ARI, Tal Sfani. Now what's a bit ironic is that while we have so many people joining, of the, joining us at this event from Latin America, Tal is actually in Brazil right now at a conference down there. So Tal, would you like to uh, join us and say a few words? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. hi. Okay. Yes, uh, I guess I'm living in the future because I'm fighting for it today. And uh, I got inspired by, by, by the video. Um, but uh, thanks, uh, thanks for this. Uh, I'm so excited. I just went off stage in a, in a great uh, conference here, the Leader, Leaders of Tomorrow in Vitoria in Brazil, uh, where we got a standing, I got a standing ovation uh, for uh, describing why the foundations of free markets is, is moral. And the only one who defends that properly is Ayn Rand. So 
I'm very excited about this. I, I love the theme of this event, the Ayn Rand and the revival of the Enlightenment. I think Ayn Rand is the revival of the Enlightenment. And you'll get uh, to hear from the best speakers in the world to talk about the Ayn Rand as a philosopher of the Enlightenment. So happy to be here in Brazil. I know that a lot of Brazilians have registered to this event. I'm happy to see that uh, right now with technology, you can get a real-time translation of everything we're saying into, into uh, those uh, native languages. So we're removing barriers of understanding those ideas. And uh, I'm honored uh, to, to keep uh, Rand's flame alive. And I want to thank again, Mike 11, uh, very touching words. Uh, you make it all possible. So thank you for uh, for this uh, for this opportunity. So thank you so much. I don't have the best uh, conditions here, but I'll be watching and listening. And you'll be personally signing up all the uh, people in Portuguese at uh, at your conference, right? Exactly. <laughs> you got it. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Tal. It's perfect. So. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of these welcome remarks. So, you know, without further ado, I think let's turn to our first talk of the conference. Just a reminder, if you're watching on Zoom and you want to listen in a different language, um, this is how you choose the different languages, choose the interpretation module and switch to Spanish or Portuguese. Um, now, our first speaker of the conference is Ankar Gatte, and he's the CPO, the Chief Philosophy Officer of the Ayn Rand Institute. He's one of the world's foremost experts on Rand's philosophy, and he's gonna give the keynote talk to set the tone for the conference. He's speaking on the enlightenment and the foundations of liberty and progress. So Ankar, you can join us. And I'm going to turn it over to you. And please remember to speak slowly for the interpreters. Thank you, Keith. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Mike Levin and everyone else that make this conference possible for the last seven years. It's, it's great being here. And thank you for everyone who's attending from around the world. Uh, the, as Keith said, one of the benefits of having an online conference in this pandemic is we can reach more people online. It's certainly not the same as an in-person experience, but I'm glad you're able to join us today. And thank you to our translators, both in Spanish and Portuguese. As Keith said, I'm going to try to speak a little more slowly. I know it's difficult to translate philosophical concepts, but I can't guarantee that as I get into the material, I will maintain the slow, steady pace, but we'll see. When I was in graduate school in philosophy, I was interested in enlightenment thinkers and enlightenment philosophers. And I can still remember when I talked to some of my professors about this and about this interest, I can remember the laughter. And it was laughter that, well, these might be interesting figures historically, but they have no relevance to today. Um, everybody knows that they just had a naive belief in reason, in freedom, in progress. But that, that belief is naive, it's passe. We've all learned that uh, they were wrong. And I can still remember the laughter of one of the professors. And we laugh at the Enlightenment at our own peril. If you ask why care about the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment thinkers, my answer is that everything we enjoy today the amazing world we enjoy today. There's certainly problems in our world, but just think of this event and what makes it possible that where you have people around the world connected by technology. It, I can still remember when I, early on in my teaching, when we did audio uh, conferences around the world and that seemed cool. Now here we're doing video conferences around the world. This is an enormous scientific and technological achievement. And it really rests on the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment thinkers, the Enlightenment figures who advanced knowledge, who advanced science, who advanced reason. The Enlightenment period is the birth of the modern world. It's the first time in history that we had the idea that progress is possible, progress on an unprecedented scale, that you can think in just a decade or two that, oh, we should be living very differently than we were two decades 
ago. I mean, the, think of just the internet in the last two decades and the way our lives have been transformed. And this is now a regular occurrence. 20, 30 years from now, life is going to be quite different from what it is now. And this idea that progress is possible and that it's achievable if you work for it comes from the Enlightenment. Uh, the whole creation of America comes from the Enlightenment. It's really the last great achievement of the Enlightenment era, the founding of the United States of America. So if for no other reason than to, so why care about the Enlightenment? If for no other reason than just to express your respect and gratitude to the people who were able to achieve this, in the same way that uh, here in the US, we have in, in May, a Memorial Day holiday where we remember the fallen soldiers who fought to defend American freedom. So to care about the enlightenment, one should be express respect and gratitude for the thinkers who have, have achieved so much. And that's part of what I'm gonna talk about today. But there's another reason to be interested in the enlightenment thinkers. It's that I think all the destruction and death that we've witnessed in modern history, and if you think of the 20th century, two world wars, the rise of fascism, of socialism, of communism, and of theocracy that spread across the globe in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in South America, in the Middle East. That whole development, I think, is a product of anti-enlightenment ideas and anti-enlightenment philosophy. And we need to understand that as well. I think today we live in a mixed world a world that's part enlightenment ideas and part anti-enlightenment ideas. And if you want to consistently fully pursue what's good and avoid what's evil, such as all these calamities of the 20th century, you need to understand both sets of ideas, both worldviews, both approaches to life. And as Keith said, this is a keynote. So what I'm trying to do is set up the uh, a basic orientation and framework and the other speakers tomorrow will be talking in more detail about some of the things that I bring up, filling in some of the details, some of the nuances. I, what I'm trying to do here is give an overview. And it's an overview from the perspective of Rand's ideas and Rand's philosophy, which she called objectivism. Because I think Rand is the thinker um, that I is the thinker I've read who has the most profound understanding of the Enlightenment's ideas and ideals. And by that I mean a philosophic understanding of what the Enlightenment was about, a deep philosophic understanding of what the anti-Enlightenment is about. So I'm going to be looking at in this talk now, I'm going to look at the Enlightenment through the lens of objectivism through the lens of Ayn Rand's philosophy. And I think of her philosophy, objectivism, as the philosophy the Enlightenment deserved, but never got. And I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, at the end about that, but in a, in a way, the whole talk will illustrate that point, I think. Um, I said that our modern world, I think of as a mixture of enlightenment and anti-enlightenment ideas. It is not a stable mixture. So if you think of it like in a sci-fi show when, when they mix matter and antimatter and you've got, a, got a, an explosion, when you mix enlightenment and anti-enlightenment ideas, it's a similar kind of explosion. It's not stable at least. And you will either move in one or the other direction towards in more enlightenment ideals or away from it. And people today are rightly worried that we're moving away from some of the enlightenment's achievements. So let me put on screen here some of what I would list as some of the major achievements that were accomplished by the enlightenment era. You should be able to see my... Uh, PowerPoint slide now here, some enlightenment achievements. First and foremost, it's the birth of modern science and technology, its development uh, and everything that that has made possible. If, if you had to pick one hero of the enlightenment, one person who was universally admired, 
and who got a hero's uh, celebration at his death for all his achievements. It was Isaac Newton. And he's the person who pushed modern science far, far further than what had been achieved in any earlier era, particularly the Greek Roman era. It's, so it's the science and technology, and then a, a flowing out of that, a view that education is possible to every rational person. Enlightenment meant you can shine the light of knowledge uh, across the culture and into each individual's mind. Everybody has a rational mind. They're able to grasp knowledge if they put in the effort and if they're educated. So there was an emphasis on knowledge education. And then a person who has the ability and knowledge to lead his own life, what he needs is political freedom. And so you get politically in the enlightenment, the ideal of each individual needs to be free. And you have political reforms and you have political revolutions, the most prominent and significant of which is the American Revolution. And political freedom means a free flow of ideas and goods, freedom of speech and freedom of trade. And you started to see this throughout the Western world and the globe, a, a, a precursor to modern globalization, that you have a flowing of ideas and a flowing of goods. <clears throat> and more fundamentally, what it created was the, the seeds and first steps of the Industrial Revolution that continued into the 19th century. And this idea of progress as possible and as real, because we're achieving more and more things through the, each year and through each decade. And what it also created into going into the 19th century is a profound individualism that we take for granted today, that we have we lead individual lives, that we have control and decision-making over our individual lives. This is a modern development uh, in, its, in its full flowering. And I would single out two elements that are particularly prominent in the 19th century. A new conception of love, that it is personal, individual. So the idea of romantic love and marrying not because for property or for some family interest, but for an individual conviction and valuing, that comes into existence and a whole new perspective on art, which is romanticism in the 19th century comes into existence. These are some of the enormous achievements that we have inherited from the enlightenment uh, era. And if you think of these and why people are worried today, apart from the first one, science and technology, all are in doubt from two to six, they are in doubt. Education, if you look over a century, education in many Western countries is worse than it was a century ago. Uh, people don't learn as much. One of the reasons there's in, for, in the US, for instance, that everybody now goes to college is from K to 12 education, they don't learn that much and they don't learn what they need to be able to cope with the world. So they have to go, everyone has to go to college. So there's worries about education. There's certainly worries about political freedom and a growing authoritarianism, a growing nationalism in Western countries. There's worries about freedom of speech. Um, if you think in Europe, for instance, and, and it's in its dealings with Islam, there's tremendous worries about freedom of speech and more generally about free trade, that there's a growing protectionism of placing tariffs and restrictions on the flow of goods and of trade. For the Industrial Revolution, the idea of uh, this kind of massive transformation of the world, the whole environmental movement is opposed to this and says, no, we need to go back to nature and we need to go back to a less industrialized uh, existence and civilization. And for six, for individualism, romanticism in art is an art in general, in, compared to the 19th century, is a dead field. So there are real worries about the achievements that the Enlightenment has brought and that there, there's a precariousness to them. And there really is a precariousness to them. They are fragile in a certain way. And that's part of what I want to talk about 
uh, in the rest of the talk now. But let me give a little bit of just sort of situating the Enlightenment, some of its thinkers, some of its figures. Um, so this is a slide you don't, there's a lot of names on this next slide, you don't need to read all of them, but you might recognize some, Galileo is here, Newton is here. The dates are the dates that they died. <clears throat> and when you think of the Enlightenment period, it's, I think you can think there's two, there's the late Middle Ages, there's the Renaissance, and then there's the Enlightenment that's really 17th and 18th century bleeding, bleeding into the 19th century. It's really second half of the 17th century into the 18th century. The 18th century is the height of the Enlightenment. And to just give an indication of life before the Renaissance, in the Middle Ages, in the 14th century, so I, I put in Renaissance as 15th into the 16th century. The, in the Middle Ages, in the 14th century, so the century preceding the Renaissance, <clears throat> to give you how precarious human life and human existence was. The two events, a, a great famine in Europe and then the plague in Europe is estimated to have wiped out over half of the population in Europe. This is what it was, when, what it was like when people lived in an unenlightened period, when they didn't have science, when they didn't have math, when they didn't have knowledge, when they were focused on uh, religion, on a next world, and on a uh, afterlife, and a, and a supernatural world. And the Renaissance is the period of when uh, European thinkers, and, and particularly, it's, I mean, when we think largely of the Ital Italian Renaissance, when we think of the Renaissance of Da Vinci, of Michelangelo, a couple of the names that I put up here, it's what well, it was a rediscovery of Greek and Roman learning and Greek and Roman civilization. And it was like the uncovering of an alien, super advanced civil civilization. And it, I mean, it astounded people as they were rediscovering ancient learning and ancient products, ancient art, statues, and so on. And this what it led to was a, a shift in focus from a supernatural realm and an other world to, well, maybe we should be more concerned with this world, with looking at it, with studying it, with creating things in this world. It, so you got in the Renaissance a this worldly orientation versus an orientation to the supernatural, to God, to a next life. And the Enlightenment flows out of the Renaissance period of this reorientation between the Renaissance and Enlightenment. It will often be put as the scientific revolution that people like Bacon and Galileo are involved in pushing enormously forward. And then when you get into the second half of the 17th century, what you have, I think, is the Enlightenment period is the, there's a confidence in, in reason, in man's mind, and in the progress that is possible. If you go by reason, if you go by logic, if you devote the effort necessary to thinking and then producing new things, there's a confidence in um, under, man's ability to understand and man's ability to know and his ability to progress. That is what the Enlightenment period is when that confidence that's coming out of the Renaissance really, really comes to its full fruition and to its full expression. And so the, one of the ways that I think of the transition between the Renaissance period and the Enlightenment is what the Enlightenment is about. So the Renaissance is a reorientation to this world away from the next world, away from a supernatural realm. And the Enlightenment project is to develop that into a full, consistent, integrated worldview. So we're moving away from supernaturalism towards naturalism, towards a focus on this world. We're abandoning the idea that faith is the way that we have to function. It's the path to knowledge, it's the path to wisdom. 
And it's no, it's reason, the thinking, logical mind. That's the path to knowledge. That's the path to wisdom. And so the project is to replace a religious worldview with a secular worldview. That's how I think of the, the, the Enlightenment project is to develop a worldview that is going to replace the old medieval religious worldview. The Renaissance breaks free of that, um, that view, but it doesn't really develop a fully consistent integrated alternative to that worldview. And that is what the enlightenment I think is a project and whatever the differences among its various leading thinkers and actors in, in, the, in, in this project, I think that is the common root and the common core of the project. <clears throat> and so if to, to think of a worldview, a worldview is a, in, a, in effect a synonym for a philosophy, but it's what people more uh, normally will call, it's a, a philosophy. It's a, it's a framework from which you view the world, in which you situate yourself in the world and from which you decide how to act and what you should be doing and what you should not be doing. And now this is a world, I'm looking at now a worldview from especially the objectivist perspective on how to think about the, the worldview that the enlightenment is in effect combating and trying to discard. It's, it's the way it's put by Ayn Rand is it's, it's a worldview that ascribes primacy to consciousness. And if you think of the whole religious Christian worldview, what it's ascribing primacy to is a supernatural consciousness, a consciousness that supposedly resides or lurks in a supernatural dimension. And that consciousness, to say it's primus, that it's primary, that it comes first, it's the source of everything. Um, and a worldview or a philosophy you can break up into four major components. It has a metaphysics, a basic view of the nature of reality that you inhabit and have to learn to navigate. So it has a view of the world in which you live or the universe in which you live. It has an epistemology, an approach to knowledge. If you're seeking true knowledge, true wisdom, what does that entail? What does that require of you? A worldview has a perspective on that. And then it has a perspective coming out of its view of the world in which you inhabit and have to navigate. It has a view of, okay, this is what you should be doing and this is what you should not be doing. So it has a morality or an ethics. And then it has a view, okay, we don't live alone on de deserted islands, just one person each. We never interact and so on. No, we, we live in together in uh, social arrangements in societies, how should those be organized? And that's what politics looks at. So a worldview is, has these components. And to say that the, what the enlightenment is coming out of is this religious Christian medieval worldview that the Renaissance breaks the bonds of, but the, the enlightenment is now trying to formulate a very different view. Well, different from what? To say that the old worldview is primacy of consciousness, think of its view of the universe, of reality. There's a supernatural consciousness. That's what's primary paramount. And it brings into existence and literally brings into existence everything else. It creates it out of nothing. So if you wanna understand what exists and why, you have to look to the supreme or ruling consciousness. And so knowledge, true knowledge, true wisdom comes from knowing sort of what God's plan is, what he's unfolding for the universe. <clears throat> and God works in mysterious ways. So you can't know that unless he reveals it to you. So he sends messages from the supernatural into the natural world, into this world, to some select people who are the ones then who possess this supernatural knowledge. It's been revealed to them. And so what knowledge is about is revelations. And for the rest of us who don't get revelations, faith in these authorities to whom God has revealed his mysterious 
ways, whether it's the Pope who's infallible and is a direct line to God, or the, the various versions in the, in the Christian religion of this, but that's its view of knowledge. So it's again, it's focused on the supernatural consciousness to whom he reveals some of his truths to people in this world. And then you, you have to be focused on their consciousness. You have to take them. They all tell you what to think. They're the authorities. You're passive in regard to the quest for knowledge. And then in regard to morality, it flows out of this view that morality is obedience to God's commands. He's going to tell you what's right and what's wrong, not directly necessarily, but usually through his chosen or anointed representatives, but it's obedience to this supreme ruling consciousness. And then politics, proper social organization, it's ruled by the anointed authorities, whether it's put as divine right of kings or it's the, the power is split between a king and a religious figure, a cardinal or a pope. It's ruled by anointed authorities. And they're the authorities because they have a direct line to this supreme consciousness. So the whole perspective of the religious medieval world, it gives primacy to consciousness. And, and this is the view that the enlightenment thinkers are trying to replace. They want a worldview that is focused on this world and on nature. So you can put it, and again, in objectivist terminology from the perspective of Rand's philosophy, what the Enlightenment is trying to do, what its project is in developing a worldview, it's trying to give primacy to existence. So a worldview that's not giving primacy and a whole focus on a consciousness, in this case, a supernatural, or at least allegedly supernatural consciousness, God in another dimension. It's a focus on this world and on the things in this world, the facts of this world. So what it's trying to develop is a worldview that says the nature of reality, the nature of nature is, it exists independently from any consciousness. It's not created by a consciousness. It's not created out of nothing by God or by us. It's not, it's independent from consciousness. It has its own laws or principles. It's governed by cause and effect, not by a consciousness. That's, so in terms of the view of reality that is, is emerging and that they're trying to formulate and have a worldview that is, is built around, it's this, giving primacy to existence or primacy to nature. And then the, the corollary is we're able to know nature. This is the, the great confidence and self-confidence in the Enlightenment era that's coming out of the birth of modern science is we each as individuals, individual thinkers, reasoning minds can discover nature's secrets and then we can invent new things. Um, the, uh, uh, Francis Bacon, a, a figure that, or an aspect of his view that Ayn Rand really liked, formulated it as nature to be commanded must be obeyed. You need to learn its secrets, its laws, it, the way cause and effect learn, works in nature, and then you can create new things based on that knowledge. <clears throat> so you have, a, so it's again, in terms of knowledge, it's not orientation towards authorities or just some other consciousness, it's orientation towards nature, to that which exists and which exists independently from consciousness. And then you have the, the, from this kind of very different metaphysics and very different epistemology, you have a focus in morality that reason can, if you use it properly, can chart your path towards a successful life and happiness. Happiness in this life, in this world. <clears throat> if you learn, so again, if you learn nature's secrets, you learn to create and invent new things, you can put yourself on the path to success, to progress, and to happiness. So again, it's a focus on like, what do you have to do in the world of nature to succeed? Not what are commands that somebody is giving you? What you look again to nature. So it's a focus on what exists, not on a consciousness lurking behind what exists. 
And then politically, the expression of this is that the government on, and the, 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 if you think of the, the sort of the highest uh, uh, figures in government are not rulers. They're not there to command you. You're not there to obey. They're not rulers. The Enlightenment doesn't look at it as there's the rulers and the ruled. A king and his subjects, it's they're your agents and you're assigning them a special function. You're giving them rational principles that it's the government and government's officials to secure. You're giving them principles that look by the nature of life in this earth, the way we need to organize society, the way we need to live together is by certain principles. And the way they're formulated in the Enlightenment is these are the rights, the rights of men. And if you think of the Declaration of Independence, it's governments are instituted to secure these rights. So it's not a ruler, it's an agent that we're appointing to serve a very special function. And it's rational principles. They're principles that come from observation of nature, including human nature, and how we succeed or fail in the world. So this is, I think, the Enlightenment project. The project is to develop a worldview that is radically different than the old religious view that places consciousness at the root of everything. It's a focus on what exists on nature. Now, that's the, I think, the, what the Enlightenment project is. And at its best, and the best thinkers in the Enlightenment have a tremendous amount to say, and say that is positive, that is true, about thinking about um, the world and the world of nature, of discovering its laws, of thinking about cause and effect, and I mean, in particular, the leading scientists, and I, and I gave Newton as he's the hero of the Enlightenment, what they were able to discover and what they were able to come to know that had never been known before in human history about nature's secrets. And so of how we can learn to control nature and reshape it to live a life that is truly human and that we can put ourselves on a path to progress. There's, so there's a, there, these are tremendous achievements in the Enlightenment period. But philosophically, the project is not to have just a bunch of discrete new discoveries. It's to put this into a worldview. It's to integrate this knowledge into a total that is a worldview that's going to replace the old religious worldview. And in that regard, Unfortunately, this is the great, I think, tragedy of the Enlightenment, that it's unfortunately the leading philosophers were unable to formulate a new worldview that is truly giving primacy to existence or primacy to nature and not to consciousness. And let me say a few words about this now. This is the real, it's the tragedy of the Enlightenment. It was why the Enlightenment is open to counterattack. It was not able to formulate a worldview that really captures in a consistent logical way the new orientation that you're getting flowing out of the Renaissance in the Enlightenment period. The birth of modern philosophy, that doesn't mean contemporary philosophy, it doesn't mean 20th, 21st century philosophy, but the birth of modern philosophy as different than medieval and ancient Greek Roman philosophy is put dated with Descartes. And I think that it's right to think of that because I think what you get with Descartes is he's the first who's starting to think, we've got something radically new here. We need a new worldview, a new philosophy that is gonna make sense of it and systematize it. But if you know anything about Descartes' philosophy, what he does, so he's the first of the moderns in philosophy. What he does is puts the whole focus back on consciousness, 
not necessarily a supernatural or divine consciousness, but human consciousness. His whole focus is what is going on in his own mind. And I can be certain of what is going on in my own mind, or at least some of what is going on in my own mind. But it's a big open question and a big problem. It's really the philosophical problem of the enlightenment. Okay, I can know things about my mind, but do I even know there's a world external to me? How do I know it's not all a dream? <clears throat> These are in Descartes' meditations. They set the, the, the central question that he's grappling with. I can know something about my own mind. How do I know there's even a world external to me? So leave aside, like, can I get scientific understanding and formulate scientific laws about this, the world of nature? It's philosophically, it's an open question. Do I even know there's a world of nature? And no thinker, no philosopher in the Enlightenment was able to answer Descartes' question and to solve his problem. People tried to answer it. Someone like Locke would, uh, so, so in England and coming after Descartes, in, tries to give an answer to it, says, no, no, we know there's an external world because it has effects on our mind. We don't observe it directly, but it has effects on our mind. Later thinkers in the Enlightenment, centrally David Hume, say, well, how do you know it has effects? If you never encounter a world external to you, how do you even know there's something out there that's having effects on your mind? All you know is the effects, but they might not be effects of anything. It just might be things going on in your mind. <clears throat> um, and so in terms of a, a view of reality, that there's a world that's external and independent from the human mind, philosophically was, yeah, we can't establish that. We don't know that. Yeah, in common life, everybody assumes it, but you don't know it. You can't put that as part of a philosophical system. And similarly, in regard then to knowledge, the Enlightenment is rebelling against, as I said, against the idea that you have to go by faith, that you passively receive what authorities are telling you, and they in turn receive it from a supernatural consciousness. So this whole idea of revelations, they're tossing out. You need the path to knowledge is to look out at the world of nature, to study it, to run experiments, um, to put that knowledge in mathematical form. That's how science progresses. That's how we discover scientific laws. That's what the scientists are doing. But when the philosophers are trying to understand this and to give it a explicit voice as part of a new world view, they come to think, look, we can't, we couldn't even validate that you can establish there's a world external to your mind. We can't establish that there is cause and effect in the world. We can't establish that abstraction, generalization, induction, the new method of this new science is that they observe particular instances of things and generalize, abstract, and induce. It's inductive logic that is leading to the scientific uh, revolution. The philosophers can't give any coherent explanation of how this works. And again, by the time you get to Hume, who's late, David Hume, late in the Enlightenment, it's no, I can't, you can't establish cause and effect. You can't establish that we're able to generalize and you certainly can't establish that induction works. So there's a real and growing in the enlightenment skepticism. <clears throat> so, and it, it, if you think again, so it's, we're supposed to be oriented to nature, but we don't even know if there is a world of nature external to us. And we certainly couldn't abstract and generalize from the things that we observe, even if we're lucky enough to encounter this world external to us. So it's in, in the fundamentals of philosophy, the enlightenment thinkers are not able to give a coherent account of what it means to have a new world view that is free from looking at consciousness that, oh yeah, we know consciousness, it exists and how it works. That's what's primary, but we can't establish anything beyond that. And what you get then, um, let me do a screen share again. Uh, here we go. 
the so that's in metaphysics and epistemology that can't make sense of the this new orientation that they're getting from science in morality then it reverts back to a kind of view that morality comes from consciousness and from human consciousness from desires from feelings from sentiments that we experience that's the the source of good and evil it's not god's consciousness it's our our consciousness and what we feel what we experience our passions our sentiments and then when you look at the actual content of morality in the enlightenment period it's heavily influenced by christian doctrine um and i think uh, robert mayhew will talk in some detail about this but it's again what i'm going to emphasize is the orientation is back to consciousness it's morality doesn't come from the observations of nature and of trying to figure out how we best can live in nature it comes from our consciousness it comes from our emotions our desires our feelings and when you look at the best attempt in politics which is john locke's philosophy uh, philosophy so in political philosophy to give an account of where do rights where do the rights of man where do individual rights come from they come from in the end god's uh locke's account is they come from god they come without a supernatural consciousness you can't make sense fully of rights and you can see that even embedded in the declaration of independence we're endowed by our creator with certain rights that's the, if they're going to give a full philosophical explanation justification of it they again have to appeal to consciousness so they're trying to develop a new world view that is gives primacy to nature to existence but they're unable to do it and this is the great it's the tragedy it's the vulnerability of the enlightenment it's why in the 19th century the enlightenment in the intellectual philosophical world was swept aside and the person who's responsible more than anyone else for sweeping aside the enlightenment philosophy and saying look yeah there was a whole enlightenment project but it's failed and indeed the argument is it had to fail and that's the philosopher emmanuel kant who's viewed as an enlightenment philosopher typically i think but i view him and certainly ayn rand i think viewed him as he's the end of the enlightenment he's the first and the major force behind the anti enlightenment ideas and basically what his basic philosophy says is look what we've been trying to do in the enlightenment what we've been trying to do in the enlightenment is develop a world view that gives primacy to existence primacy to nature it exists independently from the human mind or from any mind what science does what human knowledge does is it learns from the world of nature it learns to conform its ideas and principles to what exists independently in the world of nature that's the enlightenment project and kant's perspective on it is it's failed and it had to fail it had to fail because the human mind by its nature is unable to reach beyond itself it's unable to know anything in a a world that exists independently from it by the very nature of its functioning of its processing of it being active it creates a world for itself and it has to do that and we have to just accept this philosophically that that's how it has to work this is what kant called his the copernican revolution in philosophy and it was a revolution in a sense in the deeper sense it's going back to the old medieval view the medieval view is that everything in the world of nature is dependent on a supernatural consciousness the kantian view is no the whole world of nature is dependent on human consciousness it's a product and creation of human consciousness so it's just a secularization of the religious view it's now not god that is in charge of everything and that creates things 
um, and, and creates the fundamental nature of reality. It's the human mind. It creates, as in, in the Kantian philosophy, it's put a whole phenomenal world. That's the world that we know. That's the world that we interact with. It's a world created by our consciousness. What lies beyond that and so on, which he calls the noumenal world, you can't know, you can't even really know there's a noumenal world, though um, Kant says, in effect, you can feel that there is. So this is a complete rejection of that you can be oriented philosophically and you can have a worldview philosophically that is focused on nature, focused on existence. Kant said, look, the enlightenment's failed. Philosophically, it had to fail. We have to go back to the primacy of consciousness and develop a philosophical worldview that is based on the fundamental truth that nature is beyond our grasp, that the world is a world created by us. Now, not by each of us individually, but sort of by the human mind as a collective. And so what you get in the 19th century is a revival of the religious view that gives primacy to consciousness. You get a revival of it in a secularized and collectivistic form. Let me put this up of what you get. <clears throat> so what the 19th century is the return of the primacy of consciousness, the old religious medieval view but now it's not a supernatural consciousness in charge of every, everything. It's a group or the collective consciousness that is in charge of everything. And, and I've put here as an example of one obviously prominent 19th century philosophical and ideological movement, but there's certainly more than just Marxism. But Marxism is an example that many people are familiar with and it's a worldview that has wrecked havoc in the 20th century and put an end to countless, countless millions of individual lives. And it's, it was what it is in philosophical terms is a return of the primacy of consciousness. So now the, the view is it's a group consciousness that creates reality in the Marxist philosophy, what the, the, the whole of history of economic reality is created by the unfolding of group or class conflicts. So just as the Christians had this whole story of the development of the world, of the unfolding of God's plan and the movement towards um, judgment day, and hopefully if you were on the right side of judgment day, ascendancy to heaven. So the Marxist view has this, this same kind of framework and dynamic but now it's group consciousness, the proletariat, the bourgeoisie that are involved in unfolding reality. And supposedly you're gonna reach a Shangri-La after the dictatorship of the proletariat where everyone will be, uh, you won't need government every, anymore and everyone somehow will be happy and provided with all goods and so on. But it's this, it's, in terms of reality, it's this unfolding of a will not a supernatural will, but of a collective group will. And what you get then the corollary in terms of what it means to really possess knowledge, to possess wisdom. The old religious view is it's to be connected to the supernatural consciousness. For the, in the Marxist view, it's to be connected to the histor, as it will often be put, the historical dialectical process, which is sort of the group on consciousness, it's unfolding, it's being revealed. So just as um, God's ways are mysterious, except if you've got revel revelations, so history's ways are mysterious, unless you're Marx and you have some kind of uh, revelation or, or intuition insight into this group will that is unfolding. And if you know a little bit about Hegel, Marx is a materialistic view and spin on Hegel, which is, again, this kind of uh, adamantly primacy of consciousness viewpoint. 
So it's the whole focus now is a back on consciousness, a group consciousness, a collective will. And in morality, just as the old religious view was obedience to God, so here and to God's will, so it becomes for Marxism and communism and socialism, obedience to the general will, to the social good, <clears throat> to the public welfare. Uh, and you take orders, and the orders are largely Christian, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, is a Christian slogan, in effect, that Marx and the socialists take and implant into their view. But it's so easy to implant because it's basically the same view. Instead of a supernatural consciousness giving you orders and telling you to love your neighbor, it's a group collective consciousness that is giving you orders, telling you to love your neighbor, to subordinate yourself to his need. And just as politically the religious view was ruled by authorities, so it's the same in the Marxist communist view. It's one party rule. So it's philosophically, it's the same view as religion, a primacy of consciousness, and that your whole orientation has to be towards the ruling consciousness. But it, now it's no longer a supernatural consciousness. It's secularized. It's supposedly brought into the natural world. But it's a group collective consciousness now that is ordering everybody about creating and unfolding history. And this that this view and views like it, fascism flows out of this kind of view as well, came to be dominant in the 20th century. It was only possible because of the failure in the enlightenment of being able to give systematic expression to a very different worldview that no longer gives primacy to consciousness, but gives it to existence to nature. And that, uh, I'm gonna close now with this, that is what objectivism is about. That is what Ayn Rand's philosophy is about. And if you want a reason to explore it, as I said er early on in the talk, if you want a reason to explore it, it's the philosophy that the enlightenment deserved. It's, it, I view it as it's the worldview that the best people, thinkers and creators in, in the enlightenment, People like Newton, people like Jefferson. Uh, I, I put up, I mean, the think of some of the artists like Mozart or Houdon, who's you can view as the sculptor in the Enlightenment or a, a Enlightenment figure, certainly. What they deserved was a worldview that would match their, their incredible and new achievements. And what objectivism is about is about a formulating a worldview. So it's consciously formulating a system of ideas, not it has one thing, one insight here and another discrete insight there. And so it's formulating a worldview that is explicitly and fully on pri a primacy of existence orientation. So here I put up in a sort of a nutshell, one way to think about what objectivism, what Rand's new philosophy is about. It's, it, it gives primacy and dominance to the universe, to what exists, to nature, that it exists. It's not created by anything. It's not subordinate to a consciousness. It's independent from consciousness. And she has a new account of how to think about cause and effect of why this is a fundamental component or law of reality. So she has a new explanation and defense of cause and effect. And she has a new view of the nature of reason that Descartes is wrong, Hume is wrong, Kant is wrong. Reason is able to know a world external to it. It is able to abstract. It is able to generalize, to induce scientific principles and scientific laws. I think I view Rand as she's the first thinker to answer Descartes, Hume, and Kant, who, if, if you want the three philosophers, I think most responsible for the tragedy of the enlightenment that it couldn't formulate a proper worldview and then abandon it, it's Descartes, Hume, 
and Kant. And she explicitly takes them on and has answers to their uh, viewpoint. <clears throat> and from that base flows out an approach to morality that is radically different than someone's telling you what to do, someone's giving you commandments, someone's ordering you about. Morality comes from a focus on the world, on nature, on an, your own life as an individual human being, and what fundamentally will make your life go well. <clears throat> what will put you on the path to, as it's put in the, in the declaration, the pursuit of happiness. And Rand's answer, basic answer to that, is um, similar to what's the best in the Enlightenment, that it's a, it's a life of thought and of production, of working, of creating, of progressing. But she has a, a much deeper and better validation of why this is right, and she makes no compromise with the old Christian worldview that morality is about self sacrifice, self abnegation of trying to erase yourself in effect from the world to only be a servant, only others count, the other consciousness counts. There's a complete rejection of that in morality. And I think, again, Robert, maybe we'll talk a little bit tomorrow morning about that. And then you get a new account of the foundation of rights of individual rights. There's no appeal to the supernatural, to a supernatural consciousness. It's not that we're endowed by our creator with certain rights, nor is it that rights are a gift from the society, from a, from a collective consciousness. Rights flow out of, again, a, in Rand's philosophy, they flow out of from a focus on nature, on understanding the nature of human life, of what's required to live and to prosper and to progress. And what you need, the sort of the social conditions or requirements of, of the pursuit of life, of progress, of happiness, the social conditions are you have to have the rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. So she gives a, a very different philosophical justification of these. And what she's forming is a system. So these principles, if you read in Rand's philosophy, if you read Atlas Shrugged, if you read Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, if you read The Virtue of Selfishness, if you read Philosophy Who Needs It, what you'll see is the interconnection of these principles into a new system of philosophy. And it's again, it's the system that the Enlightenment needed it, the, it, what it deserved, but which it never got. But that we have it now can put us on a path to the unlimited progress that the Enlightenment promised, but was unable to fully achieve and was vulnerable to the counterattacks of the anti-Enlightenment forces. Okay, so let, let me stop there. I think that gives you an overview both of a little bit about the Enlightenment, I think a little bit about how Rand and objectivism view the Enlightenment, its achievements, and why those achievements were vulnerable. And tomorrow you'll get some more detail about this, about the struggle with religion, moral views in the Enlightenment, some about political freedom, and then some of the positive consequences, well, both negative and positive, I think of, a, of the anti-enlightenment forces and the enlightenment forces that endured into the 19th and 20th century with uh, Tara Smith's talk and Yaron Brooks' talk later in the day. Uh, Greg Salmieri, I think he's second, will be talking about some issues about political freedom. So it'll be Robert, Greg, Tara, Yaron, and it will fill in some of the details of things I've been talking about, but hopefully this serves as a framework. Okay, so let me stop there. I think Yaron is joining me for questions. Uh, but yeah, Keith, you can take over. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Ankar, for an amazing talk. I think that really sets the tone for the whole event and gives people an overview uh, for what 
they can experience if they want to register for the whole event, if they're not already registered. So please, uh, you still have time to do that. So go ahead and do that. So we're going to move. We got plenty of time for questions because the talk started a bit early and we're going to be joined by Yaron Brook. Uh, for people who don't know him, Yaron is the uh, host of the Yaron Brook show on YouTube and other platforms. And he's also the former CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute and the current, current chairman of ARI's board of directors. Hi, Yaron. It's okay, so uh, we're going to be using the Zoom Q&A module for questions. So if you look at your Zoom controls, you should see a button that says Q&A. Um, we're taking written questions using the Q&A module only. So please put your questions there rather than in the Zoom chat. Um, we can't promise that we'll get to every question. We've already got quite a few coming in. Um, we're also taking questions over some of the other platforms that we're on. On the English YouTube feed, I believe we have the Super Chat feature turned on. So if you want to use the Super Chat, you can make a donation and we'll prioritize questions from people who make a super, who ask a question using Super Chat. We're also taking questions in Spanish and Portuguese. So if you're on Zoom or you're on one of the other platforms and you're, and you're asking a question in a different language, we have translators standing by. We've got a whole team working on, all the, on these things here. So uh, it, we should be able to take questions from all different sources and put them into this Q&A. Um, and just again, just a reminder that uh, recording of the event is not permitted. Now we have uh, questions that are, some of them are, um, a little more advanced and some maybe very specific and narrow. Some of them are a little more basic. Um, so Ankar and Yaron, why don't we start with some of the more basic questions and we'll kind of build up to some that are maybe a little more technical. So you, you gave, you had a slide where you gave a whole series of dates, um, but do you want to say a little bit more about when you would regard the start and the end of the enlightenment period, um, just as a quick overview and reminder of that? I would put it as its second half of the 17th century. And on my slide, I mean, there were a lot of people on it. So Descartes, who I talked a bit about later in the talk, dies 1650, I think. So the second half of the 17th century. And as I put it, I think of him philosophically as you can think of it as the beginning of the Enlightenment, though usually Descartes will be put as he's just before the Enlightenment. But if you think of it, his project as he's consciously, we need a modern philosophy and that, that matches the modern world or the, the, or the world that's unfolding. I put it there. I put it from the second half of the 17th century into the first decade of the 18th, but that's, uh, sorry, the 19th, but that's again of people when they die so someone like Haydn dies, uh, I think 18, I forget what it was, 18, the early 1800s, and Beethoven dies. And it's sort of the cusp, it's the cusp of the 19th century, the Romantic period versus the Enlightenment. But so I put it roughly 1650 to 1800, but, but the, we're talking about a historical period. So there's not a God who's arranging everything and puts it everything into these neat categories. So there's always transitions. There's, and the first half of the 17th century, I think is a transition period from the Renaissance into the enlightenment. And the early 1800s are a transition from the enlightenment into the 19th century, the romantic period. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with that. I, I, it's very, it's, but there are no hard lines here. I mean. Darwin in, in, a, in a lot of the kind of middle 19th century uh, figures of, in a sense, enlightenment figures, in a sense that they're, they're Renaissance men and they're, they have, and, and they're interested in a lot of different fields and they, they, their ideas are consistently enlightenment based. Um, but the enlightenment as a movement is dead by then, even though there are specific figures involved. And then early, um, I mean, a lot of people call this like the, the they, they take the enlightenment in phases and there was this early enlightenment of the late uh, 17th century from 1650 on. Spinoza is probably the, the, the central philosopher of the time because he's really, he's doing a lot of this work of breaking away from religion, 
which, uh, which and, and his books are banned and nobody's allowed to study them and people are smuggling secret manuscripts around to, to read him and to study him. So it's fascinating if you go back and read what's going on back then because the, the, all these people interested in ideas and science and philosophy and yet there's still the, the old forces trying to suppress that and to deny it and there's this movement, uh, uh, intellectual movement that is happening in the late 17th in the late 17th century to bring these ideas to the forefront, to the point where you get to, you know, uh, the late 18th century. Well, all this is done in the open, uh, in relative open. I mean, Voltaire still has to run away from Paris because he's he's scared for his life because because he's attacking religion. Um, so yeah, 1650 to 1800 and and many figures that go through the 19th century. Okay, so this is another question that I'm, so I'm going to pull it from a few sources here, a few people asking a related question, and some of these are coming over the Spanish channel and they've been translated, so I apologize if we, uh, if I don't quite get it exactly right, but there are questions about the relationship between the Enlightenment era thinkers and the worldview that goes back to the Greeks. So which of the Greek philosophers were most influential and are there, and, and both, you, you know, you talked about both the positives and the negatives in the enlightenment period and, and, and the developments coming out of it. So which philosophers are responsible for the positive developments and the negative? And then a related question here is what's, what's the importance of Aristotle's philosophy during the enlightenment? And then a, a third related one, just to work these all in, is what about the role of Islam in preserving the ancient works? <laughs> um, uh, and, and then uh, bringing them back to the West uh, during the Renaissance and so on. So questions merge together from three different sources there, but essentially the, the influence of Greek ideas on the enlightenment. I can start with that. Um, so if, if you take seriously that the enlightenment flows out of the Renaissance, and it's interesting in Rand's writings, she talks more about the Renaissance than she does about the enlightenment. And I think it's partly because she sees the enlightenment as flowing out of the Renaissance's rediscoveries of the ancient world. And the, the philosophers, including Aristotle, are being rediscovered in the late medieval period, I had put up Aquinas. He's one of the central people who bring back uh, Aristotle's philosophy, and it is coming in part from the Islamic world, or in essence from the Islamic world. It's so the new approach is Aristotelian, and I think the Renaissance of its focus on science, on learning on art, it's focused on the aspects of Greek and Roman civilization that are Aristotelian, that are this worldly orientation, that are pro-reason, but pro-reason in a scientific sense. I think Aristotle was the first scientist. Ayn Rand called him, he's the first intellectual. I think he's also the first scientist. It's, it's if we think of science as systematic, logical uh, analysis of a body of knowledge or of a field, I mean, Darwin regarded him as the first biologist. And it's, it's systematic investigation of and, and trying to generalize from what you're observing. Aristotle cataloged all kinds of living things, did comparative studies of the way that they uh, uh, live and function. So he's the first scientist, and that's what's being rediscovered. This this worldly orientation in the Renaissance. But one another of the tragedies. So I gave the highest philosophical view of the tragedy of the Enlightenment, of what's so great about it, and what's tragic about that they couldn't formulate a consistent worldview that makes sense of all the achievements of the Enlightenment. It's that they thought of Aristotle in effect as an enemy because he was connected to the church because Aquinas and others had taken him and treated him like an authority. If you read Aquinas and the other scholastics to get a sense of what it looks like to be so focused on authorities, 
you've got uh, um, Aquinas' Summa Theologica. It's a book like this. I've read parts of it when I was in graduate school. And it's page after page of this is what this authority says. Well, but this authority seems to contradict him. And so how do we make sense of all these authorities to get some kind of consistent view? And Aristotle's put as he's one of the great authorities. And the Enlightenment is rebelling against this whole view of authorities. And they think of them often, they think of themselves as they're rebelling against Aristotle. And to even compound the problem, they think they're embracing Plato. And in the ancient world, Plato's the philosopher who is most on a primacy of consciousness orientation. He's a philosopher who says there's two worlds, the other world, the supernatural world, that's what's really real, that's what's important, that's what you should give primacy to. It's a world of disembodied ideas. But nobody can make sense of a world of disembodied ideas, so it gradually morphs into a more Christian view. It's a world with a cosmic supernatural mind. That's what you have to orient to. And so, so Plato's on the primacy of consciousness. Aristotle's the primacy of existence philosopher. They're treating him as though he's like primacy of consciousness. He's an authority. He's demanding this. And Plato is, this is who we should turn to. It's one of the reasons they're not able to formulate a proper worldview. One of the things Ayn Rand says, and she talks about that this is another tragic aspect, is they didn't take the leads from Aristotle that they could have to develop a proper worldview. But one of the reasons they didn't is they thought he's on the side of religion. So, so that was one of the three. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, I think they were all heavily influenced by the Greeks. They all read the Greeks. They read other philosophers. Other, I mean, I, I read a lot about um, the Enlightenment. They read Epicurus. They liked Epicurus. They liked the Roman philosophers. They were really intrigued with ideas. And, and, and uh, if you look at Jefferson's library, when you go to Monticello, you get kind of a sense of what a library looked like uh, of an intellectual in the 18th century and the scope of what they read. Uh, but I agree with uh, with with uh, Ankar. They were Aristotelians who didn't know they were Aristotelians, and therefore never really embraced the philosophy fully, and therefore couldn't take advantage of it completely. Let me just let me because I've done some research on this. Let me just talk about the Islam issue. Um, th there's no question that uh, Islamic uh, the Islamic world from about the 9th century through the 13th century or 14th century really in Spain, preserved the writings of Aristotle, preserved the writings of the Greeks more broadly, not just the philosophical writings, but the, uh, the, uh, the uh, dramas, uh, you know, the plays uh, the, that, and they, you know, there was a, it used to be competitive in the 10th and 11th centuries in Baghdad, who had the best library of translated Greek works. And they built the greatest libraries the world has ever seen. And uh, at, to that point, at least. And uh, luckily, a lot of that was also being done in Spain uh, under the Moors, uh, the, the, the Muslim occupation of, uh, of, of the Spanish peninsula. Because in Baghdad, when they turned against Greece, when they turned against Aristotle, when they turned against this world and reaffirmed their commitment to Islam and to religion, they burnt all those libraries down. And then, of course, the Mongols came and wiped it all out. But it, it is said that within 50 years, they went from having the greatest libraries in the world to having none because of the impact of religion. Uh, luckily, those libraries were preserved in, the, um, in Spain. So when the Christians conquered Spain and started conquering city after city in Spain, they would take those libraries and ship them to Paris. And, of course, Abelard, I think it's Abelard who's also on your list, Abelard is one of the first thinkers who's reading Aristotle and taking him seriously. And in the books go, and, and, and he, he's a little before Aquinas, but the, these books are starting, the Greek philosophers are starting to influence uh, the Catholic church from the libraries in Spain. Many of them are being translated into Latin, not from the original Greek, but from Arabic. Uh, from from this from these libraries. So, yeah, I mean, if you think about that civilization, that short-lived civilization in the Arab world, um, they were advanced in in mathematics. Uh, they invented double-entry uh, bookkeeping and accounting because they were very kind of trade-oriented. Uh, they made real advancements in medicine and in um, and in 
other areas of science, uh, wherever Aristotle has touched, you've got civilization. You you get you get a, a this this you know where he's taken seriously. You get this the same effect. You get science and a respect for uh, some respect for the individual and and a real flourishing of civilization. I think the the real tragedy of ancient China, in a sense, is they never really got that Aristotelian touch, and they never developed their own Aristotle. If you if you read a little bit about Chinese philosophy, you realize that they have no epistemology. They have no concept of reason early on in their philosophy. And to me, that's what kept them. They, they kept advancing and then crashing. A lot of that has to do with they never had the philosophical foundation that we had, luckily, in the West because of Aristotle. All right. So we got to, I, I, we, yeah, sorry, go I was ahead. Just gonna, if, if we want to plug our salons, Robert Mayhew, who's a scholar in Aristotle, but he's also done work and knows a lot about Aristotle in the Renaissance. And so so if, if whoever asked this question, if you've registered, you can go to Robert's salon and ask follow-up questions. He knows a lot about this. Yeah. So we've got a couple questions coming in over the super chat. So uh, this is a question from Adam. So thank you for your donation, Adam. And the question is, um, why is Rousseau listed as a genuine enlightenment figure? Or where, maybe more broadly, where would you put Rousseau? I mean, he's in the enlightenment period, but how would you characterize him in the in the way that you um, broke down the various worldviews? Yeah, I think of him as he's rebelling against a lot of the Enlightenment. He is, he's in the heart in, in time period of the Enlightenment. And in that sense, he's part of it. He's a mixed figure. It's very interesting to read Voltaire's reaction to Rousseau. Um, and if you go to, what is it, the Pantheon in, in Paris, their, their graves are against, facing off against each other. And if you think of Voltaire as one of the great figures in the Enlightenment and, and committed to its ideals, he viewed Rousseau as in many ways an enemy. And I think he's right to think that. I don't, there's some aspects of Rousseau that are better, but he's in, in part of what I put about primacy of consciousness. I put it about a general will. I mean, that comes, uh, that one formulation that comes from Rousseau, and he's moving in the direction that is anti-enlightenment. He's in certain ways a precursor to Kant. And the difference, so Hume is a dead end in the enlightenment. I don't think of him as he's anti-enlightenment. He's more, look, our projects failed. And it, look, at I've got all the arguments for why it's failed. And, but he's not particularly happy that it's failed. Whereas Rousseau is more pushing to, it's back to nature, the primitive reason is a sort of straight jacket. And, and in that sense, though he's in the enlightenment period, he's fighting against the enlightenment in, in deep ways. I mean, just to follow up on that, there's a question from Lauren asking about Kant in that respect. You know, he has this essay, what is enlightenment? And he clearly, views himself as, as a figure within the Enlightenment, um, though you're describing him as someone who viewed the Enlightenment as having failed. So how do you reconcile that with the things that he himself says about, about the period? Yes, he, so he has an essay on what is Enlightenment. Its motto, the motto of the Enlightenment is, I think one of the ways Kant formulates it, is dare to know, which is a good motto. But if you think of the essence of Kant's philosophy, it's, no, you can't dare to know. You can't know anything. You're cut off from reality and accept it. Stop trying to reach reality. Stop trying to get outside of consciousness and so on. If you would just accept that you don't know anything about nature and about reality, then I'll give you science and I'll give you your learning and so on, but don't claim that it's knowledge about reality. That's what I insist for you because I need room. And I think uh, Robert Mayhew will talk about this tomorrow. I need to make room for my mystical morality and you enlightenment figures with your emphasis on reason and nature and so on, you're putting an end to my mystical uh, morality, and I don't like it. And so I'm going to cut reason off from reality, which is what the essence of Kant's philosophy is. 
And if you think that's what he's doing, which I think certainly Ayn Rand thinks that's what he's doing, it's just hand waving towards that he's pro enlightenment because he's putting an end to the power of reason, which is the essence of the enlightenment. So just another quick follow up. This is from Mary Aline asking, in effect, how self-conscious about this was Kant, or do you think Kant was? You know, do you do you think he knew he was tearing down something good? Or I know it's hard to <laughs> speculate about such things, but so I'll tell you my perspective on this, which is I put a lot of stock in Ayn Rand's perspective, and I'll give you the reason why. So she viewed Kant as the most evil person in history. And I think because he's putting an end to the power of reason after we've had this enlightenment era, er, era that has so showcased the power of reason. And this guy comes along and tells the world, no, reason can't know anything about reality. Now, if Kant was some schmuck or put it, th if he was me, I can imagine making all kinds of errors that screw everything up. But he's a genius. And so, and Ayn Rand's a genius, I think. And to have the perspective that a genius has on, there's, her perspective is there's no way a genius can do this innocently. And I take that seriously, that that is the right perspective, that it is, he's too knowledgeable and he's too conscious if you read him of what he's doing. And he gives you every once in a while, pretty explicit things about, I found it necessary to not deny reason, to make room for faith. And so, and when you read things about the morality that it's, it's no, this was, can just be errors. And, but it's, again, it's, you have to take seriously. This is a genius formulating a system of philosophy that's cutting reason off from reality. All right, we got another uh, super chat question over YouTube. And the question is, is there, would you say that there's, that between a secular primacy of consciousness or a religious one, would you say that one of them is worse or not? My view is no. And I think Ayn Rand's view is no. To get her perspective on it, you have to read the lead essay of, for the new intellectual, which is a very, I mean, it's a fascinating essay, but it is difficult. But part of the perspective on that essay is that there's a certain mentality that is attracted to evil philosophies. And it's, if you think of it like that, it's the same mentality that is involved, say, in the Spanish Inquisition and the Nazi torture chambers or the Soviet gulags and everything that goes into creating these and so on. And if it's the same mentality, they're just using a different device. In the 19th, 20th century, you couldn't appeal to religion. The enlightenment had too much pushed religion off the intellectual scene. You weren't credible if you said like, oh, I wanna bring back the Spanish inquisition. But if you wanna bring back the Gestapo or you wanna create the Gestapo, Oh my God, you're the benefactor of mankind. Um, and that's just because it was taken seriously that you've got the social primacy of consciousness. Yeah, that's a new scientific view. The religious view isn't, but it's the same mentality that is attracted to them. Um, and in that sense, it's the same results and I don't view a difference. Yeah, I mean, the results are exactly the same. So if you judge it by the number of people killed, by the authoritarian nature of the regimes that they institute and just the sheer destruction, um, I, you know, there's, there's no real difference. I mean, there's a sense in which, there's a sense in which to be religious in the 21st century, to accept that for mysticism seems more primitive, ancient, but they're both so despicable that it's hard to differentiate, hard to say which one is worse than the other. Because we're also living in a post-communist, post-fascist era, right? Where, well, not so post, I guess. <laughs> not so post. Yeah. But, but, uh, we've seen, we've seen the, 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 we've got plenty of evidence of the consequences of both, and the idea that people still 
you know, are still religious or still advocates of, of, of communism or, or different forms of, of that, of, uh, of uh, the social primacy of consciousness is just shocking. Okay, well, we are getting close to the end of our time here. Uh, we have way more questions than we can possibly get to. So I wanted to take another question from, um, that's been translated from Spanish. And it's really, it's, it's a question about the fact that um, most of the figures in the Enlightenment period were religious, such as Locke and so on. And so, what? A, so the question is: Isn't there some influence of Christianity on the pro, on the on the good progressive things that came out of the Enlightenment? Um, and how, how would you reconcile the fact that those figures were religious? It's hard to free yourself from a religious worldview, and that's in in effect, part of the talk, that how difficult it was, and, and, and if what you're trying to do, and what it means fully to free yourself, is to develop a worldview that is completely uh, separate from a religious worldview. It's really, really difficult. So it's a long transition after centuries of the religious worldview being pounded into people to get out of that. And they're not religious, most of them, in the way when you read the medievals. The, and, and even medieval thinkers, like I gave Aquinas, and the whole thing is about authority. Even though he gets that, well, Aristotle's telling me to look at nature. Well, okay, if an authority is telling me to look at nature, maybe I should. It's to get how different the Enlightenment period is. You, you need to see some of what it's coming with and the Renaissance. Uh, what it's coming out of the, the medieval mind. Um, so it's difficult to free yourself of religion, particularly when they're thinkers who want a new worldview. Like it, they're not content to just, okay, I'm dispensing with the old worldview. What am I replacing it with? And it's very difficult to do that. I, so there, they, there's remnants of religion that I think when you look through the enlightenment are fading and necessarily fading given that they're more and more emphasizing the power of reason and that reason can figure out everything. So it's the less and less you need religion. And I don't, my view is, it, this is controversial, but that Christianity contributes nothing. That's my view. But my view is that it's the Renaissance is the rediscovery of the ancient world. And so who is the Enlightenment building on? They're building on the Greeks and the Romans, not the Christians. The Christians are in the way, and the Christian mindset is in the way, and they can't free themselves from it. But they're building on the Greek and Roman. And I want to emphasize here Roman. The creation of the United States of America required the thinkers to be studying Roman history, Roman government, and so and studying it in detail, we, this is again the Christian influence, we think of Romans, we've been taught to think of the Romans as they're the gladiator, I mean, they go to gladiator fights and like to watch everybody bloodshed and kill each other or go to orgies. Like that, that's the Roman, this is a Christian caricature of the Romans. If you lived at the time, you would have thought and rightly thought the Christians are wackos and the Romans is such an advanced civilization that you could have this kind of global empire around the Mediterranean that has trade and that has laws. People wanted to live under Roman law. This, it was the Roman empire, whatever, and Republic and then empire, whatever its flaws, had tremendous positive uh, aspects to it. I mean, it's said that, I mean, this is what I was taught when I took Greek Roman history. The European world didn't achieve the standard of living of the Roman Empire in the first century AD until the 19th century. And it's the rediscovery of this that ignites the modern world, not the Christians. Yeah, good, a good illustration of that fact is, is Rome at its, at its, in the, I think at the fourth century AD reaches a million people. In the, in the, I think it's the sixth or seventh century, it's down to 10,000. And the next European city to make it to a million is London in the 19th century. 
I mean, that's just a, and, and cities mean something. Cities is civilization. So that's just a numerical uh, illustration of that point. And if you go to Pompeii, which is the best preserved kind of Roman city, you can see it. And, and you know, running water with faucets um, and, uh, and, and multi-story buildings, things that, again, they couldn't do in Europe for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, but I want to, I, I think it's important to note that Ankar mentions that, the, that the, the Enlightenment fails, in a sense. It fails to create the system. And I would argue that at least one of the major causes of it failing is that they don't completely give up on Christianity. Christianity holds them back. Whatever remnant of Christianity is in their thinking, whatever primacy of consciousness is still there that relates to God, whatever altruistic, you know, authoritarian altruistic morality comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition, is holding them back from creating a system of philosophy that is, is complete and integrated, and, and it, takes, it takes Ayn Rand to do that. So Christianity is not only doesn't it contribute anything, it is a, a clearly a detriment. It is holding them back. It is, it is destructive. And so that's, that's the first point. The other one was, one wonders how religious they were, even though, even in their writings, they're not as religious as the medievals. One wonders how religious they really were in their personal lives. That is, uh, you know, they lived in an era where you had to be religious. It was dangerous not to be religious. I mentioned Voltaire, who was the one, the French Enlightenment was more atheistic, if you will, than the, than the English Enlightenment and the Scottish Enlightenment. But it, and Voltaire was an atheist, and, and that's why he had to escape Paris, because uh, they were going to kill him. And, but Locke has to run away from London because a Catholic king is coming. And, and there's the whole issue of, of the Anglican church and the cow. And it, there's no freedom of religion in Europe at that time. I mean, it's the beginning. The Enlightenment is partially a, uh, partially a rejection of the religious wars of the 17th century. I mean, people have no real concept of the sheer number, the percentage of the European population that died during the 30 year and the 100 year war that preceded the enlightenment. I mean, it's just the slaughter is unimaginable all in the name of you're a Protestant, I'm a Catholic and you know, we're going at each other. Um, so uh, so there's the, the religious freedom doesn't exist. Uh, the, the, if they, if they, you know, Spinoza is persecuted by the Jewish community because you know, he's born Jewish and he's persecuted because he's, he's, he's kind of an atheist. And, uh, he's an outcast. His writings are banned in order not to be banned, in order for people like Locke not to be banned. I mean, I think they were religious anyway, but they had to be, they have to declare their religiosity even more fervently in order to be accepted and for their, for their writings to be published and, and circulated. Again, the only place where you could get away with it was Amsterdam, was, was, the, was the Dutch Republic. I think that's, there's a reason why Amsterdam was the richest city in the world at the time. Um, it, it was the most secular city in the world. It was the, you know, if you look at the art, it was the, it's the first city in the world really that had a respect for wealth creation and, and for wealth and for, 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 for the a nouveau riche nobility. Uh, they really respected that. So, so uh, and, and, then, and then to some extent France uh, with Voltaire and Diderot and, and, and many of the other French enlightenment figures who were basically atheists. But no, I, I agree with Anka, and I know it's controversial, but I, I, I really, I don't see what values Christianity contributed. I think the other way around, it held them back. 